Good evening once again, as we continue through uh, our little devotional mini-series here on the uh, different aspects of God and his character and his nature. Uh, again, I'm reading from the notes of the Reformation Study Bible to kind of get our thinking going. And tonight, I want to focus on the greatness of God. The greatness of God. God is great. Amen. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 21, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, Psalm, a bunch of the Psalms, Daniel chapter 9, verse 4, greater than we can possibly grasp. Theology states this truth by describing him as incomprehensible. Not that he's irrational or illogical, so as to prevent us from following his thoughts at all, but that our minds cannot contain him because he is infinite and we are finite. Scripture portrays God not only as dwelling in thick and impenetrable darkness, but also as dwelling in unapproachable light. Psalm 97, verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. These two images, impenetrable darkness and unapproachable light, express really the same thought, namely, our creator is above us, and it is beyond our power to begin to measure him. God tells us in the Bible that creation and providence and the Trinity, the doctrine of the incarnation, God taking on flesh and bone in the person of Christ, the regenerating work of the Spirit, union with Christ in his death and resurrection, the inspiration of Scripture, to go no further, all of these are facts, and we can accept them on the strength of his word without knowing how they can be. All of them, in other words, are beyond our possibility to intuit and to fully understand. But they are facts, and we can know them in part, even though we can't know them exhaustively. As creatures, we're simply unable to fully comprehend either the being or the actions of the Creator. As it would be wrong, however, to suppose ourselves to know everything about God, and so, in effect, to imprison Him in the box of our own limited notion of Him, so it would be wrong to doubt that our concept of God constitutes real knowledge of Him. It is real knowledge. One of the consequences of being made in God's image is that we are able both to know about him and to know him relationally in a true, if limited, way. John Calvin speaks of God as condescending to our weakness, stooping down, accommodating himself to our incapacity, in other words, both in the inspiration of the scriptures and in the incarnation of his son. And he does this in order to give us a genuine understanding of himself. If God did not condescend to us, if he didn't stoop down to reveal himself to us, we'd know nothing about him. But he did reveal himself. And we don't know him exhaustively, but we can truly know him. By analogy, the form and substance of a parent's baby talk. Think of how... Those of you who are young parents speak to your, uh, your little babies, or those of us who used to do that, uh, if we still do that to our uh, teenagers or 20-somethings, um, they may think we're a bit weird, and maybe we are, but think of baby talk, right? The form and substance of baby talk bears no comparison with the full content of a parent's mind, which might be expressed in conversation with another adult. But still the child receives true information and communication about the parent from the baby talk. And the baby then responds with growing love and trust. And the type of communication changes as the child grows and can receive more. But the substance basically is still the same. It's just the way in which we communicate it. That is why the creator presents himself to us in a way that we call anthropomorphically. That is, as a human, anthropos. And so therefore we read of God having a face, Exodus 33, verse 11. 
as having ears, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6, or eyes, the book of Job chapter 28, verse 10, or having feet, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, or sitting on a throne, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, 19, flying on the wind, Psalm eighteen ten, fighting in battle, 2 Chronicles 32, 8, Isaiah 63, 1 to 6. These are not descriptions of what God is in himself, but of what he is to us. The transcendent Lord who relates to his people as father, as friend. He reveals himself to us in ways we can understand him. He comes to us in this way to draw us out in love and trust, even though in a way we are always like little children who understand only in part. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. One thing we should never forget is that the purpose of theology, the study of God, is doxology. That is, the study of his glory, the study of his magnificence. Put another way, we study in order that we might praise. The truest expression of trust in God will always be worship, and it will always be proper worship to praise God for being greater than we know. And so God is great. And he stoops to us, which in and of itself is a great act, to say, here's who I am. Now, you won't know me fully. You can't know me fully. I didn't create you to be able to comprehend everything. Even if the fall didn't happen, we're still not able to be infinite. We were always finite beings and always will be finite beings. But it doesn't mean that we are completely incapable of knowing anything and certainly uh, incapable of knowing anything about God. We can know things about him. Now, we can only truly know those things in terms of them impacting the heart and changing who we are as God opens our eyes to the reality of who he is. A non-believer, for example, can read the Bible and understand what it's saying at a basic level, understand the plot. They may not agree with it, but they can understand it. But we can only um, apprehend appropriate, take on, commit ourselves to what it means when God opens up our eyes. And so it is with him. We can only understand his heart, his character, when he opens our eyes to reveal how great and loving and merciful he is. And that only comes by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. So as you read through scripture and as you come across various anthropomorphisms where uh, God the Father is described in human form, I'm not talking God the Son. When Jesus is described as a human, that's not an anthropomorphism. He actually became a human. So that's, that's language to describe the historic reality of him taking on flesh and bone. That's called the incarnation. But... When the father is described as having a hand or having a foot or something like that, that is an anthropomorphism. God is spirit. He's neither male nor female. We don't know the true form of God. But we know that he who is great and above all things has very graciously stooped down and revealed himself in part. And just think of how wonderful it will be when we see him face to face, not through a fallen mind, not through a clogged mind, not through a sin-stained mind, but face to face, praising him for the great God that he is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a great and holy and magnificent God. And uh, Lord, as we uh, reflect more and more on your greatness, we rejoice that you who are so high above us became one of us. You are high and lifted up. And yet you stooped down to our level. You came into this fallen world, took on flesh and bone. And your wonderful son went to the cross and died for us. Lord, that 
is such a great act. And only one as great as you could accomplish this great salvation that is ours through Christ. And so tonight, may our theology indeed result in doxology. And may you get the glory for all that you are. You are a great and loving God. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for joining me. And I shall see you tomorrow night again from right here in the sanctuary of TCCGP. Thank you.